our program for tonight. We are pleased to have back with us Dr. Greg Forbes. We haven't seen his face around for a little while, so we're particularly pleased uh, to have him back. And uh, give you a little background on Greg. He's the National Course Director for the National Science Foundation's Chautauqua Course on Evolution and Evolution Education for college and university professors. He also serves as the Education Director for the Michigan Evolution Education Initiative, a statewide initiative designed to help teachers effectively teach evolution. As the Director of the Evolution Education Institute, an initiative that expands the Michigan Project nationally, um, he is also the Evolution Education Specialist for the 4,000 member Michigan Science Teachers Association and a founding member of the Michigan Citizens for Science group, an advocacy group here uh, working uh, to keep uh, science uh, protected in the legislature. Greg is a professor of biology at Grand Rapids Community College. He's also the director of the Science Education Center there. He has a very broad education in biology. Uh, he earned a BS in wildlife and natural resources management from California Polytechnic, masters in biological sciences also from California Polytech, and a PhD from the Department of Zoology and also the Department of Tropical Environmental Studies at James Cook University in Australia. He holds professional certification as a certified wildlife biologist and has 25 years of university and college instructional experience. Uh, he's won numerous awards, a couple of them. Uh, in 2004, he was awarded the Michigan Science Teachers Association's highest award, College and University Science Teacher of the Year. Uh, in 2005, the Michigan ACLU selected him as Civil Li Libertarian of the Year. Um, and the Free Thought Association has also honored him as Free Thinker of the Year. So um, Greg is very uh, well healed and well experienced to talk on, our, uh, on the topic tonight, which is stem cell research. So please welcome Dr. Greg Forbes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jeff. And can you hear me back in the cheap seats? Are we good? Well, thank you for inviting me back to actually address this topic, which I addressed once before, before this group in 2004, way back when. If you remember 2004, we had a different president. That was one and a half Congresses ago. We had a different U.S. representative here from Grand Rapids in the U.S. House, and things were very different. We had a federal ban on stem cell research and cloning. Our own representative from our local house here was the person to introduce that ban into the House of Representatives. And things have changed quite a bit. So we were at the forefront of moving towards stem cell research and cloning, and it wasn't a proper environment at the federal level to continue that research. So here we are, what, seven, eight years later, and things have changed a little bit, and hopefully changing for the better. With the new presidency, one of the first things that was done was uh, to overturn the federal ban on stem cell research. But then a U.S. District Court came in and said, well, we're not really going to do that yet, and overturned the overturn on the federal research funding. And then the U.S. District Court was asked to put a stay on that hold. So now we have an overturn on the overturn on the overturn, and we're waiting to see if it will be permanently overturned. So as we speak right now, what time is it? It's okay to use federal dollars to do stem cell research and for cloning research, and this is a good thing because the vast majority of all research for stem cell research and cloning research comes from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. And so if those funding sources dry up, we're gonna have some serious issues with dealing with stem cell research funding and cloning. You may ask yourself, well, why do we care? After all, what good is it? Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Because back in 2004, we were rubbing crystal balls. We were saying, well, we hope we'll be able to do this someday. We think we're gonna be able to do this. Well, we have some good updates for you tonight to tell you where we were and where we have been, where we're going, and what we see in the very near future, and what's happened this month, last month, and the month before. Really some pretty exciting things happening now that we have not only federal funding, but an environment that, at least as we speak here now, seems to be favorable for stem cell research. 
We have a new House of Representatives at the federal level. We'll see what happens and how favorable funding maintains itself. But as we sit here tonight, things are looking pretty good. So what we want to do here is talk about really what is stem cell research? What the heck is a stem cell? What's cloning and what's all the fuss about? And why should you care? Or are you comfortable knowing that all of your legislators, who probably have never had a biology class, are the ones making the decisions for you on whether we should have this funding or not? Because this is going to continue to be a social and a political hot potato, and that's OK. Because many issues in science now have a very strong bioethical bent to them, and they should. We have what? Right to life issues, right to death issues, genetically modified foods, climate change, the list goes on and on. And many of these have bioethical complications or ramifications and we should have these discussions, but we should have these discussions as informed participants. And that's what many of us don't have the ability to do when these disciplines are outside of our own. I mean, you know, how many people learned about stem cells when they went to school? The field of research really wasn't there in the detail it is now. So what I want to do tonight is introduce you to what the heck is a stem cell? What's cloning? And this is a little bit of a review of what I did in 2004, but we kind of need to have that background in order to have the discussions as to where we're going, why is it concerned, what are the limitations, and what are the possibilities, and why should Congress even be concerned about what we're doing here? So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do, first of all, Embryology 101, a really quickie introduction here to what makes an embryo an embryo. And we're going to look at some terminology that we just kind of have to have to have the conversation. But then we're going to follow that with kind of stem cells 101, you know, an introduction to stem cells. What are they? Are they all the same? Because in your lexicon, you know about embryonic stem cells, don't you? And that's what raises a lot of the concerns. Are all stem cells created equal? Are embryonic stem cells the same as adult or somatic stem cells? Are all embryonic stem cells created equal? And what's the fuss? Where do they come from? And what are we doing with them? Then we'll take a look at where were these sources. I think you might be surprised as to where we have opportunities to get stem cells to do research on. And then what are the benefits of stem cell research? When I presented in 2004 to this group, there was commentary from the First Lady at that time that there, there are no immediate applications to stem cell research. There are none on the near horizon, and nobody should tell you otherwise. Not entirely true. We've been using stem cells for over 40 years in what? Bone marrow transplants, and we'll talk about that, and that's using stem cells. We've been doing it for over 40 years, and the applications and utility of this have just expanded exponentially since then. And then we'll take a look at cloning 101. You've all heard about Dolly the sheep. How do we do it? You say, well, are we talking cloning? Are we talking stem cells? Yes. They're intertwined, right? One begets the other, and they're completely related to each other. And then we'll talk about kind of like that Hello Dolly. You know, how do you clone the sheep next door? And if you can clone the sheep next door, can't you pretty much clone anything? And what little exercises we'll do, I did with you, I think, in 2004, is we'll find out, can you clone yourself? Can you give birth to yourself? Can you give birth to your mother? Can you give birth to your grandmother? And what's the answer? Yes, we'll show you how to do that tonight, okay? <laughs> and then we'll take a look at the debate, you know, what to do, what to do, what to do. To ban, to advocate, to cautiously move forward, or just slam the door or open the door? What are we going to do? So let's start out here with Embryology 101. And first of all, we have to talk about fertilization. You guys all remember your conception, right? In the back of the minivan? I know, you don't want to think about your parents doing that, but I'm thinking they did the deed at least once. Okay, you're kind of evidence of that. So if you remember back to your sperm or egg days, right? We have that sperm that's, of course, going to contact that egg. And at that point, with a little more magic and hocus pocus, we wind up with something called a zygote, right? A zygote is when the chromosomes from the egg and the sperm come together. And we're back up to the normal chromosome count. And this is what happens at fertilization. And so what happens when we wind up, like this little guy in the middle here, which is our fertilized egg, eventually it turns into something called a zygote. It's a single cell. What's it going to do? Just hang out? No. What it's going to do next is divide, right? Mitosis happens. So the next stage we get into after fertilization is called growth. Look what's going to happen. We go from a single cell to a two-cell stage to a four-cell to an eight-cell. This is a learned audience. From eight to 16, 32, 64. 128, we're losing you, 256, 512, 1024, 2048. Get your iPhone away. He's got down pushing in numbers, okay? So, so what we're doing here is just expanding the number of cells. And every time these divide, 
the ball actually gets smaller. Each one of these cells from the two cell to the four cell, they get progressively smaller. And this is just all growth. They're not specialized, they're generic cells. In fact, something we're going to talk about called undetermined cells because it's not yet determined what they're going to become. That's huge. How huge? Very huge. Because we're going to come back and talk about that two cell stage when we start cloning around. Because at this point, each of those cells are identical. In fact, if you take the two cell stage, we separate them, put them back into, whoa, put them back into a uterus, they're going to wind up producing twins, okay? Because they're generic at this point. So stick with me. So the first several days, all the embryo is doing is increasing in number of generic cells. We're going from, again, zygote to two to four to eight, etc. Then we get to the stage called determination, which happens right down here. In determination, now it's determined what each of those cells is going to become. In fact, we've studied many animals to the point where we know what every single cell will give rise to. That cell number 42 will eventually give rise to the left leg in the frog. 62 will give rise to the right eye. You can actually map these out and see what they're going to become because at this stage they're determined. This is important because we're going to talk about undetermined cells, the generic cells, versus determined cells. Because what we've been able to do is take determined cells that are, for instance, kidney cells and make them generic again, make them undetermined so we can make them into a whole other organism. And this is what's really cool. We've done some amazing things since 2004. So we have fertilization. We have growth. The cells become determined. They get their marching orders. They get their job descriptions for what they're going to become. Then we get into differentiation. This is where in the early embryo, cells are going to form common tissue start moving together. So the cells of the skin start moving towards that location. The cells of the digestive tract start moving to that part of the embryo. So you have migration of these cells throughout the embryo forming tissues, organs, and eventually in our next step, morphogenesis, organ systems. And in humans, this is right around week number eight. Week number nine, you actually have the development of organs and organ systems. This happens pretty fast. So we have that fertilization, we have the growth, we have the determination, we have differentiation into tissues, and then we have the production of organs. But through each one of these steps, really important things are happening in the cells. And we have to know how those things are happening, why they're happening, when they're happening, in order to modify what the outcome of that cell is going to be, what it's going to grow into, and what it does. So here's our review, because of course there will be a quiz later on. Fertilization, right? Back in the minivan, formation of the zygote. Then we had growth. All we're doing is increasing the number of cells. They're still what? Generic or non-generic cells? Generic, right? They're undetermined. We don't know what they're going to be. Our next stage is determination. Even though that ball of cells looks the same, we now know what every cell will eventually give rise to. It'll become a heart tissue, it'll become a pancreas, etc. Then we had differentiation. This is where the cells begin to organize into tissues. And then our last stage here, we wind up with morphogenesis where we begin to actually form organs. And this is well on its way at eight weeks in humans. Now, stem cells 101. You look at this and you think, this is something I don't want growing in my bathroom or on my skin. And you wonder, we'd almost have spent a few minutes, is what the heck is this? This is what the dentists are wetting their pants about right now. We've discovered stem cells in teeth. And this is the photograph you see in all the dentist websites. Many dentists, are you ready for this one? Drum roll. Willing to harvest stem cells from your teeth and store them cryogenically in case in the future you have need for them. So if you lose a tooth, hang on to it, put it in the freezer behind the fudgicles, you could be good, okay? So this is one of our most recently discovered stem cells. You could tell just by looking at it. You probably want that on your shirt or something, okay? So, so what constitutes a stem cell? What makes a stem cell a stem cell? Now that we've talked really briefly about embryologic development, well, stem cells, the key point here is they're capable of long-term self-renewal. Sounds kind of zen, doesn't it? Seems like you should have a tie-dye shirt and candles and be sitting cross-legged. But what is continuous self-renewal? It means you're able to keep reproducing. Most cells in your body reproduce on average about 50 times and then they're done. For instance, the vast majority of your brain cells, your muscle cells, you're not producing any more muscle cells, you're done. Stem cells, on the other hand, have the ability to continuously divide to go through a process called mitosis that many of you have studied. And they can go through this 
almost indefinitely depending upon the type of stem cell. What's indefinitely? A week? Two weeks? Decades? Theoretically, forever. And so stem cells, by definition, never go through differentiation or determination. They stay generic, and that's what's so important. Because if they stay generic but have the ability to become anything, we have the possibility, hopefully in the future, to tell them what we want them to become. And that's what's so intriguing about stem cells. They stay undetermined, and hopefully we can convince them to become what we want. And it's interesting here is that they can have this division over extended periods of time or indefinitely, and sometimes after years of inactivity. We recognize there are actually little depositories in our body. Most all of our glands and organs have things called stem cell niches, where these guys just kind of hang out and do nothing, sometimes for decades. How many of you guys are moms in here? How many of you guys are moms? How many of you? It's a Cal I'm from California. Okay, moms, we're going to give you something that's absolutely amazing and a little creepy later on. We start talking about stem cell niches, so hang on to your ovaries. We're going there, okay? Number two, as stem cells remain, as I just mentioned, unspecialized, right? They're undetermined, and so they have that ability to become virtually anything in the body. Because remember, every single cell in your body has the exact same DNA as every other cell in your body. Can't the cell in your toe, doesn't it have the genetic information to become a heart? Yes. Don't the cells in your heart have the genetic information to become a toe? So you wonder, who gave them the job description? How did I wind up as a toe instead of a heart? I would have much rather been a heart. Well, the key point is they have the genetic ability to do so. And they can give rise to specialized cells, and this is the key. All stem cells, by definition, can become determined and then eventually differentiate into cells throughout the body. So this is kind of like that panacea. Here is the ultimate cell that theoretically, if we can learn how to do this effectively, change it into any cell in your body for replacement of damaged parts, worn out parts. This is better than going to AutoZone and getting a new carburetor. You can grow your own, and that's what we're going to look at here. Now, we need to take a look here at a couple terms for stem cells, and these are tongue twisters, but we're only going to look at three of them. The first type of cell we're going to talk about, the first stem cell, is called totipotent. Think of it this way. They have the potency, they have the potential to do totally anything. Totipotent is a stem cell that can give rise to virtually any cell type in your body. All of the muscle tissues, all of the nervous tissues, all the connective tissues, and all of the uh, epithelial tissues, all the integument, virtually any type of tissue can be produced by these cells, including, here's the drum roll, the placenta. And this is the only type of stem cell can do that. In fact, if we take a look up here on our little illustration, here is our fertilized egg, and then it divides to, this is at the eight cell stage, the artist got lazy and spared us the two, four, the et cetera. And then eventually we get up, th these cell stages right here are our totipotent stem cells. Eventually, they change in ability very soon, in fact, weeks after conception, They've lost that ability to be totipotent, and their job description becomes narrowed as they mature. So totipotent have what? The potential to become totally anything. In fact, many times in the stem cell arena, are kind of referred to as being the ultimate Swiss Army knife. They can do anything, okay? Absolutely anything. And so this is one of the many reasons that embryonic stem cells are so appealing for research because they're totipotent. So if we can make them manipulate, if we can use those, and if we can't make them switch into something, it's not because they can't do it, because we know they have the genetic ability to do it. If we can't convince them to become a determined cell, whose fault is it? Their fault or our procedure? It's our procedure, isn't it? So by using totipotent cells, if we can't make them turn into what we want, we know it's our technique and not the cells because the cell has the potential to become totally anything. The next type of cell we have, a little further on in development in the embryo, is called pluripotent. Plural means multiple, right? So it has the potential to become many multiple types of tissues, but can it form a placenta? No, its job description has narrowed. It can replace itself indefinitely. So if you put these into a Petri dish, as well as the totipotent cells, and give them a nutrient auger, you can continue to grow them for decades and decades and decades. 
they won't specialize unless you persuade them to do so. That's pretty cool. So this type of stem cell is called a fetal stem cell, as was the previous one. So when we talk about fetal stem cells, we're talking about either the totipotent cells, which can become almost anything, well, can become virtually anything in the body, or we're talking about pluripotent, which can become almost anything. Then we get to something called multipotent. As we go further on in the development, we find out that these cells now lose even more of their potential to turn into anything. We wind up with a type of stem cell called multipotent. So they have multiple things they can turn into, but not everything. I've just abbreviated stem cell throughout some of these slides as SC. The stem cells that you have in your body right now, and all of you have stem cells. In your glands, your organs, you have stem cells, but they're multipotent. For instance, in your red marrow right now, you have cells called, <coughs> called hemocytoblasts. These hemocytoblasts can turn into red blood cells, they can turn into white blood cells, any of the five types of white blood cells, or they can turn into platelets. These are the stem cells that we move around when we do bone marrow transplants. So they're multipotent. They can become different types of cells, but only some type of blood cell. We have the same thing in your bones. You have bone stem cells. And these, these osteotic stem cells can become bone, they can become tendon, they can become ligament, and they can become fat. And we can take that tendon and ligament, and here's your disgusting thing for the, mo for the evening, and make what out of tendon and ligament? Marshmallows. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> Folks, that's where gelatin comes from. When you're eating marshmallows, you're eating tendon and ligaments. Jello is just refrigerated wobbly cow, isn't it? Okay, so you're a little thought for the night, okay? So, so Thank a stem cell for your marshmallows. Okay, who's ADD? Okay, back on track, Greg. Right? Okay, so, so multipolar are the stem cells we have in our body as adults, and they're commonly called adult stem cells. Why don't we want to do research on those? Because people say, don't use embryonic stem cells, use adult stem cells. Well, there's a problem. Because adult stem cells have a very limited ability to what they can turn into. So as we're developing our techniques for stem cell research, and we don't know how to do most of it, we want to know that the cell is capable of making the change we're trying to convince it to change into. That it's not the cell's fault, it's our fault. If we can't make a multipotent stem cell turn into something we want, is it our technique or the fact that the cell is unable to do it? And that's one of the reasons we love the embryonic stem cells, the totipotent and the pluripotent, because it has the potential, like when we're all young, to become anything. Look what we've done with our lives. Okay, now, what's a determined cell? We talked about this before. A determined cell is a cell that now it's determined what it's going to be. It's not a stem cell of any sort. It's determined that it's going to be a pancreatic cell and it's functioning as a pancreatic cell. It's a liver, a hepatic cell. It's functioning as a hepatic cell. It's not gonna be anything else. I mentioned the cells that are in our red marrow. They can turn into red blood cells, white blood cells, once they turn into a red blood cell, it's determined. Guess what? You're a red blood cell. No going back. So somebody who had way too much time on their hands for a PhD determined that you actually have about 70 trillion, with a T, 70 trillion cells in your body. And almost every one of these is what? Determined. You have very few stem cells in there. So our goal here then is to kind of have an understanding of this whole sequence here that we start out over here as a zygote, and then for the first several almost weeks, look at this, we're a totipotent. I realize in the cheap seats you can't see that, which is why I'm reading it to you. We have up to about the first week, totipotent stem cells. So if we can harvest stem cells off of embryos all the way up to about the first week, they have the capacity to do virtually anything. When we get up here to about week one through six, they're pluripotent. They've lost some of their ability yet further. By the time we're born, we have some pluripotent, but mostly all multipotent. So when we talk about adult stem cells, we don't mean adult as mature, we mean postpartum, right? Right after birth. Partum means what? Parturition means reference to birth. You've probably heard it with reference to postpartum depression. I heard about it listening to Dr. Tom Cruise on the Matt Lauer Show talking about postpartum depression. There's no such thing, right? Remember when he went on his rant about Brooke Shields? You shouldn't be depressed with postpartum depression. Just suck it up, do exercise, and eat bananas, and you'll be fine. So, so parturition means birth. So any postpartum cell is already going to be mostly multipotent. So where do we get them? Okay, Where can we harvest these? One option is human embryos. 
We usually get these human embryos before they get past the four cell stage. Remember, fertilization, zygote, two cell, four cell stage happens within the first 24 hours. You say, well, where are we going to get some fertility to the clinic? Most people don't understand what happens when we go to a fertility clinic. If my partner and I decide to go to a fertility clinic and we do in vitro fertilization, in vitro means out of the body, in vivo means the good old way in the back of the movies, okay? So in vitro means in a petri dish. So what we do is we harvest eggs from the female, it's actually called harvesting, it sounds like you're picking fruit, okay? So you harvest eggs from the female, you harvest about five, six, seven of them that are through fertility drugs have been ripened up, and then they're fertilized in a petri dish, a regular old petri dish. There's nothing exotic, it's in a petri dish in the lab, okay? And then you mix them together, kind of like you're making a martini shake and not stirred, okay? And then you take them up to the four cell, you take them up to the, the two cell stage, and then at that point, they're implanted. Actually, I'm sorry, at the four cell stage, we implant them. Now, you may, depending upon the fertility clinic and the protocol, you may actually have six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these eggs that have been fertilized and taken up to the four cell stage. Do you want to implant ten eggs into a uterus made for one? No, because it's not built for womb mates. <laughs> Work on it, ask your partner. You'll use it, you know it. Okay, so, so you know, you're not supposed to have womb mates in there, so you're going to say, well, Good, Kathy just got it, okay, her, her partner helped her. Okay, good, okay, I'll write them out for you next time. Okay, so, so, so what happens is, what are you gonna do with all the rest of these? You're gonna put them in the freezer behind the T-bones, right? Okay, so you have another six, seven left over, so these go into deep freezes and fertility clinics. So what if it turns out now that you had two of them in plant? You have two kids, and that's all you want. What's behind the T-bones? Another six or seven of these, right? That are at the four cell stage, you don't want them. Well, you can call up and say, please dispose of them, but that is a significant bioethical issue for a lot of people, right? Saying, please take those embryos and destroy them. So out of absence, out of mind, most people just never call the fertility clinic. So what happens to those four cell embryos over time? Just what happens to your T-bone steaks when they're in the freezer too long? They get freezer burned and they die. Conservative estimates that we have several hundred thousand embryos in fertility clinics across the United States are called snow babies, an unfortunate moniker for the event. What's going to happen to all of them over time? They're gonna die. So the question is, could we use those, instead of let them slowly meet their demise in a deep freeze, could we use those for research? And most states allow the, the parents to donate those for research if they're available. So this is a good source that otherwise, unfortunately, would just become freezer burn. Another option here is cloned embryos. Now again, don't have in your mind embryos of, you know, with a, an image of, of small infants. We're looking at embryos at the four eight cell stage. We can clone these in the lab. We've been able to do this and you can easily take them up to about the 30 something cell stage. So it's the ability to keep cloning these in the lab. That's another option. Or amniotic cord blood, which you see on the right hand side. By the way, on the left hand side is a four cell stage right over here and here's a little um, cloned embryo right here, which is the gastrula stage, and we can clone these and harvest cells from those. Or we can use amnion, uh, 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 cord blood. Now, cord blood, unfortunately, gives us embryonic stem cells, but only one kind, the kind that turn into blood components, and those are limited. So we only get the same stem cells out of cord blood that we get out of bone marrow, and they're pretty limited, so they're not a, a panacea. How about adult stem cells, what are called somatic? Where can we get adult stem cells? Well. One option, these things I talked about before, called stem cell niches. It seems like everywhere we've been looking in the body for the last five years, we seem to find very small quantities of resident stem cells in the pancreas, in the brain, etc. In fact, here's a, a, a graphic that I recognize is hard to see. Here we have a capillary down through here, and this is one of these little stem cell niches that's found in the nervous system. It turns out that some of these stem cells are actually under certain chemical commands we're just understanding, able to go into the circulatory system, move to other parts of the brain, and actually repair the brain. Remember, you were always told that you never develop new neurons. Whoops. <coughs> In fact, that's a whole different technique to stroke victims. Stroke victims, till 10 years ago, we'd say, oh, you've lost a portion of your brain. We'll try and get you occupational therapy. But now we recognize, oh, no, 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 no. We stimulate that brain and recognize there's the ability to repair it significantly, especially if you're even younger. So the old days of, well, your brain can't repair itself, whoops, 
there are actually stem cells residing there, which have some pretty neat um, applications we'll see here in a second. There are also migratory stem cells. This is really cool. As I just mentioned here, we have stem cells capable of migrating to other areas of the organ or, or gland, but they can also migrate to completely different areas. For instance, there are bone marrow cells that can actually migrate from the bone shaft to actually become blood cells to become cartilage, bone, fat, collagen fibers in other areas of the body. And this is just so cool. We're starting to see these things move all over. Now, how do these stem cells go about differentiating? I mean, you have this generic stem cell, right? Totipotent, pluripotent, multipotent, and eventually it becomes determined and turns into a pancreas cell. Well, there are a variety of different things that we've learned so far, and this is where we're learning a lot. One of which is you get genetic cues within the cell. We recognize that there are genes within the cell that turn on and say, it's now time to become the toe cell. You know, you've been generic long enough. And we're just starting to identify those and getting to the point where we can turn them on and direct the cells to turn into what we want them to. Extracellular chemical signals. You've heard of hormones before. These are chemicals that move through the circulatory system. There are locally produced chemicals called factors that don't go into the circulatory system. And those factors can actually contact stem cells and then direct it to become determined and turned into a given cell. We're now learning to synthesize these factors in the lab and have them turn into different, different, different uh, cells. In fact, there's an Australian research group that two years ago was able to take mature skin cells from an adult and then convert them into neurons, muscle tissue, epithelial tissue, and I get everything there. What are we missing there? And take them in all four tissue groups. Pretty amazing stuff happening. We also find out that sometimes these generic cells become specialized, determined when they contact other stem cells in these little clusters here that are called embroid bodies. And we have a lot of light pollution up here, but down on the left-hand side, this just looks like a bunch of cells right here. But, and over here, this looks like fungus growing on a Petri dish. These are called embroid bodies. It turns out when stem cells clump together and begin to push against each other, that's what spawns some of them to then become determined and specialized. We learn this by accident. If you leave them too long in the culture dish, they don't stay as generic stem cells. They start to become determined. So in some regions of the body, as the embryo is developing, when the cells begin to push against each other, that itself is enough to trigger determination, which is pretty cool. We then have something called epigenetics. Some of you may know about epigenetics. Most of us in here went to school in the day where we thought that everything the cell does is determined by the DNA residing in the chromosome and the nucleus. <laughs> That's so 90s. It turns out we recognize that many of the activities of that genome are determined by chemicals coming from outside of the cell. Epi, outside, genetics, factors coming from outside the genome. So chemicals are moved around the body to cause genes in other cells to turn on and turn off. And we're now starting to synthesize some of these chemicals. And another one here, transdifferentiation. Ooh, there's a tongue twister. This is where we have cells differentiating to cell types unexpected, where we can actually have brain cell stems, cells on their own, turn into blood cells. Who would have thought? It's beyond the job description. So every time we look, it's like, oh, who would have thunk that? There's just so much going on, it's almost hard to figure out where to go next. And luckily, this is why now as we speak here tonight, federal funding is available in order to start researching all these and figure out what are the details and can we emulate it, can we do it, can we make it happen for us? Because our goal here is to be able to take these zygotes, let them go to the blastocell, remove some of these pluripotent cells in here, and then turn them into the tissues of the body that we want. Wouldn't that be better than when you need, for instance, if you have a stroke, rather than saying, oh, well, I'm working on 90% of my brain, you have a heart attack, oh, I'm working on 85% of my heart, wouldn't it be great to just regrow those cells in order to stimulate stem cells, inject them into the area, and have them replace the damaged tissue? We're very close. In fact, we're in clinical trials, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. So the goal here, the overall goal, and I realize we have the light pollution up here, is to be able to take these cells from that blastula, take them out, turn them into what we want through one of those many mechanisms we just talked about to get them to become muscle cells, heart cells, retinal cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is no longer science fiction. It's happening at a lab near you. We are hoping that in Michigan, with our new governor and with the federal funding, 
will in fact become and build upon our medical technology emphasis in Western Michigan because we have in our backyard here the Van Andel Research Institute, which is absolutely stellar, world-class institute, is looking at what? The molecular basis of disease. Van Andel Research Institute isn't trying to fix you when you're broken. That's what Mayo Clinic does. They're trying to prevent you from getting broken at the molecular level. Let's stop disease at the molecular level. So hopefully here in Michigan, we'll see an emphasis upon that and we'll have a favorable environment to continue down this research. Okay, then this has absolutely nothing to do with the show. But how many pictures of cells can you see before you want to kill yourself? So this is your happy time, okay? So this is your time here to just, to, you know, get a moment, you know, look at the puppies, look at the hamster, find your zen space sailing, get back before I give you more cells. Are we all in our happy space? Okay, there we go, a zen moment. So what's our, cell, our stem line research? What have we done, where have we been? Well, in the 1950s, we discovered uh, stem cells in human bone marrow. I mentioned to you for well over 40 years, we've been doing what? Bone marrow transplants. So we hear that there are no effective stem cell treatments <coughs> only for the last half a century. And literally millions of people are alive today because of those bone marrow transplants. In the 1960s, we found out that we could take dividing cells in adult rat brains and culture them, and we weren't sure what they were, but when we cultured them, we recognized they continued to reproduce and didn't become determined. What had we stumbled upon that we didn't know about? Stem cells. We recognized that these things were in the 1950s. We didn't understand the full, the full influence, but in the 1960s, we isolated these in adult rat brains and recognized, wow, these are kind of generic cells. I wonder if they're present in humans. And in fact, in 1981, we were actually able to retrieve these cells from embryos, from mouse embryos, and that was a huge step. Way back in 1981, do you guys remember the 80s? Okay, so what happened after that? In 1998, not that long ago, we were actually able to then to remove stem cells from human embryos. We could actually go in to the blastula I just showed you a picture of and extract those pluripotent cells. And then in 2006, for the first time, we had human adult somatic tissue cells were reprogrammed to become stem cells. We were actually able to take determined cells and reprogram them into generic stem cells. That was huge. And that was in just 2006. That was two years after I had spoken to this group last time. We continue, 2006, we were able to take mouse, what are called induced pluripotent stem cells and produce these. We are now regularly taking mouse stem cells that are determined and making them pluripotent. We induce them. We force them back into becoming stem cells. This is a no-brainer done in graduate embryology labs nowadays. 2007, we can now do it with humans. We can actually take determined adult somatic cells out of humans now and make them pluripotent stem cells. We can turn them backwards regularly and effectively nowadays. 2010, October, remember that? A company in California called Garon has now begun spinal cord regeneration clinical trials in humans using human stem cells. This is so incredibly cool. The research I saw videos from about, oh, five, six years ago, where as some of you may know, if there's a spinal cord injury, a break, it's not repairable. Our peripheral nerves are capable of repairing themselves, but there are different cell components in the central nervous system. If you have a break, if you have damage, it doesn't repair itself. So what they would do is take laboratory mice, sever the spinal cord through the thoracic area, surgically sever it, and then half of the group would just be let to try and heal on their own, and of course they were lost control of organs and all movement below that sever. The others, they took adult stem cells from the mouse's brain, put it into the spinal cord break, and all of the mice regained control of the hind limbs. The video is absolutely amazing. Not complete control, but mobility. And remember, when you have spinal cord breaks, you're not just losing mobility of the legs, you're losing all the nervous transmission to the organs, the glands, etc. cetera. Garon has now started in October accepting 25 patients to this research. They're looking for patients that have a thoracic break, less than, I think, 14 days old, 
to take human stem cells and put them into the break, and it looks incredibly promising because we can do it over and over again with laboratory animals. Folks, this is the new age, right? If you break your back right now, you're out of luck in so many ways. This is starting now. They're currently recruiting, and I think they have half of their group already. So pretty amazing. November 2010, remember that? Another company called Act Incorporated, also in California. Gee, why are all these companies in California? Because California in 2004 voted to what? A, become a host state for stem cell research, and B, fund it. So Act now, in November, has just begun trials for retinal regeneration using human stem cells. If, you're, if you have retinas damaged, the retinas don't repair themselves. But they're actually putting in permission from the National Institutes of Health, the FDA, and they're in trials right now injecting, as we speak, these stem cells over the next week or two. Take a look at this. January 2011, remember it? Okay. Seven days ago, ACT Incorporated just got National Institute Health approval to begin the next set of clinical trials for macular degeneration. Folks, the vast majority of us in here are going to have macular degeneration. degeneration. The portion of the retina that has the highest concentration of rods and cones, it degrades for a variety of reasons, and it results in complete blindness. They're now taking human stem cells, plant them in there, and new rods and cones will form. They have, but in humans, it'll be in the next couple weeks, it's been successful in dogs, cats, mice, and rats. Pretty cool, okay? Current uses of human blood stem cells. What else do we have that's out there? We don't have to read what's in white text, folks. We can use stem cells for effective treatments of leukemias, lymphomas, including everything you see listed there. We've been doing this for over 30 years, almost 40 years, using stem cells from bone marrow. We can treat uh, severe aplastic anemia and other bone marrow failures, including, including things like aplasia. And we've been doing this for the 15, 20 years. This is incredible. Bloodborne diseases are things that are very treatable. We can treat all kinds of inherited immune autodeficiency orders by putting in stem cells, human stem cells, including sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia isn't a disease you have to die of anymore. Stem cell research and use utilization has been very good with that. Uh, myodysplastic and myoproliferative disorders, including things like uh, well, malignancies, and you can see the list right here, 27 vowels in each of these. But look at the list. Each of these represents a host of diseases that we're able to deal with. So what are some potential uses? We've seen that we're being very effective so far in what we're able to do, what's around the corner? Well, what we need to do here is further our understanding a little bit of these events in human development and studying stem cells is the way to do that. We don't fully understand exactly what's happening in the very early stages of embryonic development. We don't understand why the cells turn into what they do, what chemical cues, and the stem cells allow us to do that. What also allows us to, stem cell research, identify how undifferentiated stem cells become differentiated cells. How they differentiate and when they're supposed to do it and when we don't want them to do it. Folks, this is what happens in cancers. In cancers, you have uncontrolled cell replication, uncontrolled mitotic division, and this is based upon signals that we can learn from in stem cells. Testing of new drugs. Is it, whoa. Okay, testing of new drugs. Is that, do we really have to test new drugs in human organisms? What we're able to do is culture these cells, take the stem cells, have them turn in. If we're testing a drug on pancreatic cancer, let's produce just the cells in the pancreas that the drug will target. Rather than giving it to an individual and have it go through their entire system, we can, we can actually grow just the cell that that chemical is going to target rather than doing clinical studies on humans. Also, cell-based therapies. We've talked about spinal cords just now. Cell-based therapies are taking cells to fix disease rather than surgeries, rather than pharmaceuticals. We're able to now look at repair of spinal cords. Diabetes. We're able, currently as we speak, to take cells within the pancreas, turn them back to where they're undetermined, and then have them act as pancreatic islet cells that produce the insulin in the pancreas. We're doing this now. That's pretty cool. Think of all the diabetics in the world that could benefit from that stem cell therapy. Stroke victims. We've recognized we can now take stem cells harvested from the brain and put them into, we're not doing this clinically, we're doing it with laboratory animals, 
take those stem cells, activate them to become neurons in other regions of the brain and replace the brain tissue that was lost during the stroke or the trauma. We're doing it with heart disease. In mice, we're actually able to take cells, inject them into the damaged part of the heart when we induce a heart attack in mice. Sorry for all you mice lovers. But we're actually able to have those stem, those stem cells turn into new cardiac cells, myocardial cells, and regenerate. We're not exactly sure how that's happening. We know that the heart gets stronger. We're not sure if the stem cells are turning into myocardial cells. Are they somehow affecting the native stem cells to regenerate? We're not exactly sure. And this is what we're able to do, like with mice. I mentioned we can do that in mice hearts. We can even take the stem cells out of the, we can inject these into the tail, remove them from the tail of a mouse, and have them migrate to organs of concern. It's amazing. So what are the hurdles? Do we have it all figured out? Oh my God, no, okay. What we need to be able to do, first of all, is we need to do our stem cell research. We have to reproducibly be able to differentiate them into the desired cells. If we want it to be an, a pancreatic cell, we can't do that regularly. Sometimes we can't even differentiate. We're way at the early stages of the learning curve here. We also have to be able to be able to get these cells to proliferate extensively and generate large quantities of stem cells for making tissues. We're not good at doing that. We're not even close. We also have to make sure the stem cells we use survive in the recipient. It's no good to have us have your heart be better for a couple weeks until the cells die, right? They have to integrate themselves into the tissue. We also have to be able to have them after they integrate to remain in those tissues and function for the duration of the recipient's life. And this is what we're able to do, we believe, with the three clinical studies I just cited with spinal cord, with retina, and with macular degeneration. In laboratory animals, the cells persisted and became fully functional cells. And we have to do this without harming the recipient. Now, with my students, I teach anatomy, physiology primarily, we look at a lot of disgusting things. So as a public service, I always let them know that the next pictures that follow, anytime you see this guy and we have the light pollution in here, but this is a little orangutan hiding his eyes. When you see this, it's your call if you want to watch the next picture, okay? What happens when good stem cells go bad? Let's take a look at teratomas. And this, tonight's presentation, by the way, will be on YouTube tomorrow, and it'll have all the, the colors and everything corrected, so you can watch this with all the, the better images and whatnot. But these are teratomas. You may know them as dermoid cysts. Both males and females get them. Have you ever heard, when you read those great literary magazines like National Enquirer, World Globe, it says, my mother found out that my mummified twin had been in her ovary for 20 years, and they found teeth, they found fingernails, they found hair, and car keys. Is this possible? No, you can't get car keys in there, but the rest of the stuff, yeah, okay? It turns out that stem cells have the ability in pathological conditions to go from being undetermined to determine and then differentiating into cells. In females, now if you can see this here, this is an ovary. Those are teeth. This is sebum from a sebaceous gland. Over here, this is a tooth. I wish you could see with better light. This is hair. This is scalp. That's hair down through here, okay? Over here, this is a testicle. Those are teeth. Okay, over here, this is hair and scalp. How cool is that? Okay, now, I had a student once that called me, you know, she, after she'd had my class, she goes, Dr. Forbes, I just came back from the doctor. I go, yeah, because I get phone calls from students years ago. I remember when we talked about so-and-so cancer, I have it, and I hate those phone calls. Well, this one was like, I went to the doctor, guess what? I go, she goes, I have a teratoma. I go, well, I'm sorry, she goes, no, what's cool? They took it out and I asked if I could have it and bring it in to you. <laughs> Her OBGYN goes, I've been removing these for three decades and nobody has ever asked to A, see it, B, have it. But, but she understood these were just wayward stem cells that for some reason decided to go ahead and specialize, okay? And that's what these are. So guys, next time you feel a little uh, binding down there, it could be your dentures, okay? So, so <laughs> This is what happens when good cells go bad, okay? And these are things that are, you know, not of it. We get them all the time. We get them absolutely all the time. Now here's what, remember for you moms in here, I said that we may or may not uh, gross you out. Okay, all of you moms in here, when you were in that third trimester of development, things were happening inside, which of course you're well aware of. I went, you know, the baby would use your bladder as a trampoline, you know, you felt like the 51st state, all those things that go with it. But when you're producing blood, 
The maternal blood circulatory system is completely separate from the fetal. The baby produces 100% of its own blood. There's no direct interaction between the two circulatory systems on paper according to the blueprints. But during that last trimester, you know, when you're sporting eight, nine pounds of baby, four or five pounds of fluid, in a uterus that's the size of an infant's hand, something's got to go. So there's some placental tearing. And what happens is, is some of those embryonic stem cells, the pluripotent stem cells, migrate from the baby's circulatory system into yours. This is where we do the doo -doo 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 -doo. Now, the first part's gonna creep you out, okay? There's a good side at the end, okay? Here comes the creepy part, okay? Those stem cells move into your body, ladies, and they set up residency in every gland and organ we've looked at. They're called remnant fetal stem cells, and they stay pluripotent for a very long time, till you're in your late 40s or 50s. Then they start becoming determined. They determined and they move to various organs in the body and sometimes they cause havoc. This condition up here is called scleroderma, hardening of the skin. And we've known this for a long time. It used to be called werewolf finger, not a very you know, nice term, okay? But now don't wig if you go, oh my God, I've been having a dry spot. That's winter, it's Michigan, it's okay. But these become really very rigid and we could never figure out what they were. But then we had the ability to do DNA analysis. We pull the cells off of these and find out something very strange. Only half the chromosomes in those cells are moms. The other half are dads. Uh-oh. <coughs> Work this one out. Because <laughs> your baby is what? 50% you mom, 50% dad. These weren't mom cells at all. Whose were they? The babies that have moved up to the surface and can cause havoc. Sometimes they can call, cause lethal conditions. This is one of the reasons we believe that women primarily have autoimmune disorders compared to males, because you can have these remnant fetal cells that begin to give us problems. Well, here's the bad part. Ladies, for all you guys who, fought, who, who gave birth to a child of a man that you never want to see again as long as you live, <laughs> he's always under your skin, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you can't get rid of us. You can divorce us, but we're always there. Okay, so, so here's the good news, and I'll give you the short reader's digest version. There's a gentleman who, uh, I'm forgetting his name right now, who was told that his remnant fetal cells caused the death of his mother. What a great thing to tell a 12-year-old child. So he decided, well, this is bad. So short story made long. He decided to spend his life studying these things called remnant fetal cells. And he's now the guru of this. He's recently produced a coffee table book on this. And he found out in his research, he became a molecular biologist. His research has shown that, yes, he could cause some problems with these. But also, who's most likely to live longer, women who have given birth or women who have never given birth? Now, as you moms, you'd swear this is not going to be the truth. Moms live longer on average. We think part of that is because these remnant fetal uh, stem cells can not only cause havoc, but they can turn into anything in your body. And they're 50% your genome. And it turns out they may, in fact, impart abilities for your liver to regenerate, your spleen to regenerate. So actually, your kids could be helping you out, what, ladies, throughout your entire life. That's the good side. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that may be the case, that they're able to avoid the lymphatic response, undetect it, and actually regenerate some issues. Some, some tissues. Pretty cool, huh? Let me just take you through a couple more things here and then we'll call it quits because we're almost out of my hour here. Cloning. Let's take you through cloning 101. Cloning. What's cloning? Cloning we're going to take, we're going to produce genetically identical cells by manipulating a parent cell to do what we want. Commonly we do this with stem cells, don't we? Embryonic cloning is something we've done for a very long time. If we take you up to the two cell stage, the two cell stage here, all we have to do is separate these two cells. We can implant them back into the uterus and they'll develop identical twins. There is a dairy business in Caledonia that's been doing this since the 70s. They take cattle embryos up to the four cell stage. They separate them. They put them into four surrogate uteri. Uteri, is that a plural? Uteruses, uteruses. And you wind up with what? Four identical twins. That's a no-brainer. But that's doing it with what? Undetermined embryonic cells. That's a no-brainer. You do it in undergraduate labs. But here's a bigger question. Knowing that, could you give birth to your mother? 
If you can take the two cell stage, divide it in two, and each one will turn into a completely intact human, and that's what happens in humans. Twinning in humans is almost always only at the two cell stage, which is why we get what? Twins, right? Rather than quadruplets. So can you give birth to your mother? Let's take a look. Okay, I spared no expense here on getting the visual aids, okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so here's what we have. I didn't know you could get pregnant Barbies, but apparently you can. <laughs> So here's what we're going to do, okay? It gets better. Okay, so, so, okay, so, so we're going to have your grandmother, okay? Your grandmother, we're going to, it turns out that she's having problems conceiving. So we harvest your grandmother's egg, and we get grandpa's sperm, and we do in vitro fertilization in the Petri dish. We take it up to the two-cell stage. One of those cells we put in the deep freeze. The other one we put into grandma, okay? Grandma then gives birth to your mother. Your mother decides she wants to do it the old-fashioned way, with Ken, okay? So, so mom and Ken get together, make nice, nice, and they produce you. Are we good? Okay, now the question is, can you give birth to your mother? Do, 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 do. Okay, well, it turns out, you can, okay? Because it turns out, remember we had one egg in the freezer? Well, it turns out that dad, it turned out, I mean, we don't know who he was anyway. We don't know if he's really your dad because mom had history, okay? And by the way, you had a hot mom, okay? So, so we're going to get rid of the guy. And you've decided, you know, I really didn't like my dad, but I love my mom. In fact, I'd like to have birth to someone just like my mom. But you remember how mom was created from a cell of which it's identical is in the freezer. So you get it, have it implanted into you, and you give birth to who? Your mom. No-brainer. We do it with livestock all the time. It's a no-brainer. Coming soon to a safety freeze near you, okay? So can you do it? Sure. Can you give birth to yourself? You can, can't you? Okay. So you say, well, you know, I gave birth to myself. I'm kind of God's gift to humanity. How can we do better than this? Why dilute my genome by 50% with a male genome when I am the pinnacle of creation? So you remember that in the freezer, what? You have another egg. So what are you going to do? Implant it. And who do you get? Hand me down, close it, fit. Okay. So this works out really well, doesn't it? <laughs> Now, we can do this naturally. You can twin around. This is cloning around naturally. Every time bears give birth, guess what? Identical twins. Goes up to the two-cell stage. They separate. They each implant. Deer, every time they give birth, identical twins. Two-cell stage, separate, implant. Armadillos, four. Goes up to the four-cell stage, separate. They all implant. Hey! What's really cool, nature the first year gives the bear one offspring and the deer, one offspring. It's nature's way of saying, this is your trial run, but after this, it's full production. Okay, so first year, it's one. After that, it's twins. So in the last couple slides I have for you here, what can we do, though, with adult stem cells? It's a no-brainer with embryonic stem cells because they're still generic cells, aren't they? They're undetermined. Can we take adult somatic cells that are already determined, turn them back into generic cells, and then make another complete organism? And yeah, here's Ian Wilmot. Um, who, and his, his sheep Dolly, who was successful after 277 tries, he and his Scottish research team were able to produce a fully cloned adult mammal. And here's how they did it. They took, here, here is, um, this is the surrogate mom, but they went into a U, they harvested an epithelial cell from, I guess in sheep it'd be down here, from the mammary glands. They took that mammary gland cell and they removed they, they uh, took the nucleus from that mammary gland cell. They took another cell, removed its nucleus, implanted the nucleus that we want to replicate into the host cell. It then went through division. They then put that into a surrogate uterus and gave birth to Dolly, who was what? Genetically the same as their, its mother. You see what we did? We took, and this is the first team to ever do it, take a determined cell, like taking the cell out of your toe and making another you. Doesn't the cell in your toe have the genetic information to become a heart, a pancreas? It has everything to become you. 
But if we put it in a Petri dish and grow it, it'll just become more toe cells. We don't want that. We want it to go back to be a stem cell, a totipotent plur or a pluripotent stem cell. We're going to then put it into a, an egg, so a denucleated egg from another animal, plant that nucleus in it, the egg then goes through division, and we wind up going through normal embryonic development, going through what? Growth, differentiation, morphogenesis, and we wind up with Dolly, a genetic identical clone of the mother. If you don't know stem cells, you can't do cloning. So why worry? How bad can this really get? <clears throat> okay? You know, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know, what are the terrible things that could be created here? Well, you know, people are spinning all kinds of stuff out there, and you know, we're doing some pretty amazing things with gene splicing. But the big concern here comes, here's physicist and reproduction researcher Richard Seed. In 2004, he announced that he was going to clone himself. And it hit the fan because he had the money to do this and he decided he was a pretty cool guy, so he thought the world would be better by having a whole bunch of Richard Seeds, which scared all of us. Now, had it been Shania Twain, okay, we could have gone that route, okay? But it was Richard instead. So people are worried, my God, will we have people cloning themselves? Well, you think about that. I mean, that's a potential, isn't it? We, we could do it now. There's an international ban about cloning humans. Cl cloning humans. University of Wisconsin at Madison is the leading edge here, doing all kinds of farm livestock, cloning dogs, cats. There are commercial services now to have your loved kitty cloned. Why you'd want to clone them rather than pick them? I, but I don't know. Some people like cats, okay? So you can actually commercially do this now. So, but what are people worrying about? Well, do you guys remember? You may not. There was an old movie. That's actually Gregory Peck there, Boys from Brazil. What did they do? They found, I hate to tell you that it's a great movie if you've never seen it. You don't know what's going on till the end. But they discover some of Hitler's tissues or blood, and they start cloning him in a city in Brazil. So, are we worried about that? Some people are. So, in conclusion here, what's our debate? What are we really worried about in this whole bioethical debate? Your question should be, and something we can talk about when I finish here in a minute, is that should cloning or stem cell research be allowed in the United States? Should it be allowed in the world? Should the U.S. government, your tax dollars, fund it? If the U.S. government doesn't fund it, should the state support it? Would you be okay with that, like in California? Would you be okay about the research being done or not being done? Do you want it done or do you want not it done? Not want it done? Who said that? Okay, or do you want to prevent it from happening? Another option here to look at is that will the technology be developed out of the U.S.? If we don't do it, are we thinking that in all the other countries are not going to do it? Oh, we're seeing that happening already. During the research ban, most groups moved to Europe to do the research because funding was readily available. Research can continue without government funding. So if we allow private funding to do this, isn't the government just sticking their head in the sand? If we allow private research funds, which we do, by the way, in the United States, there's no ban against private funding of stem cell research. Is cloning of human cells okay as long as the embryos aren't produced? Are you guys comfortable with us taking it to the two-cell stage, four-cell, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512? At what point are you uncomfortable? When it has toes, when it has fingers? Think about that seriously. When are you comfortable as saying that's far enough and then trying to figure out why you made that decision? If you've said yes at all, figure out, well, why have I decided four is okay, but eight's too far, but 16 I can't live with? <laughs> what about fertility clinic embryos? Remember all those snow babies I talked about? Are we comfortable knowing that there are at least several hundred thousand slowly dying of freezer burn? Or they might be used in research, or you'd rather just let them lay where they are right now? So there's your question. Thank you for listening. <laughs> are, are you moms still a little creeped out out there? <laughs> it's either the cysts or the, the fetal cells. All right, I'll come around with the mic and uh, we'll take questions and comments. Hey, Greg. I seem to remember you did a lecture few years ago where you mentioned that Geron Corporation in California 
And they had been working on ways to stop cells from dividing as a way to cure cancer. And uh, shortly after that, like about six months after your lecture, uh, their stock went through the roof. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was the same company. Yeah. Uh, what the, the game plan for most biotech companies is to do a press release of some absolutely astounding breakthrough they are in the precipice of making. Stock goes through the roof and the company is sold. And, and one of them was the, um, what happens here is we were talking about whether uh, every cell, every, every chromosome has at the end a little code, a little section of DNA that doesn't code for anything. They're called telomeres. And every time a cell replicates, it loses some of these. And when they lose all the telomeres, it can't reproduce anymore. None of your muscle cells have telomeres, which is why you'll never produce more muscle cells. Your neurons no longer have uh, telomeres. So what this company was doing is saying, we have figured out a way to keep the telomeres from being knocked off. And so cells can constantly regenerate themselves. Well, there are pros and cons, because cancer cells don't obey that telomere rule anyway. So, but the stock went through the ceiling. Yeah, and I don't know if it's Geron for that one, but that's a, that's a common thing in the biotech field. Uh, just uh, how long do the, uh, uh, I think it's the four cell stage, mm -hmm. the uh, fertility clinics, how long do they last in the field? Uh, well, they're right now, in it, they're, there's, no, there's no national registry, so the numbers we look at are speculative because all these fertility clinics are private, right? And most of them won't d divulge who's in the freezer, how long they've been there. But without a doubt, we, we've been doing in vitro fertilization for 30 years. And so we know that they're in there for at least three decades. I don't know that anybody has gone back several decades later and said, you know, I'm 60 now, I'd like another child. So, so I don't know. Sperm, on the other hand, can go for, we have sperm that's viable after 40, 50 years. Uh, we can freeze eggs. We couldn't freeze eggs effectively um, until whole eggs recently. But uh, there are issues because they're damaged quite rapidly. This is different than freezing a gamete because it's a large biomass. And chances are they're not viable after a short period of time. So it's probably of, of no value. So if we said, let's open up and just use for stem cell research, all of those snow babies that are 10 years old or, or longer, no one's going to touch them because they're most likely not viable. They're probably not viable after several months, actually, you know, because we recognize we're only successful, although we're really good at doing in vitro fertilization, depending upon which clinic's doing it, we have like a 40 to 60% implantation rate in the uterus, which is why you put in two or three, hoping one will catch. Unless you're, of course, the Octomom, where you have a dozen put in and, <laughs> okay, you get eight. Uh, I understand that uh, not only the sheep, there's some complications that otherwise through cloning that the, uh, the animal is short-lived for some mm -hmm. reason. Yep. Now has this uh, research advanced to the stage where it's, uh, uh, it's better now than uh, earlier tests? Yeah, what we found out is getting back, and I think everybody heard the question, is that Dolly, what we found out ge genetically, she wasn't uh, firing on all cylinders. Because it turns out that you're cloning the animal, the genetic age of the animal it was cloned from. Remember we just talked about these telomeres that we're losing? So it turns out that there are some complications. If we're going to try and clone Richard's seed at 74 years old, we're not going to get a young spring buck out of it. So there are some issues there. So we recognize if we're going to do this type of cloning, that's one of the things that we need to address. But University of Wisconsin-Madison is doing really leading this. And if you look at cloning young mammals and, and birds, we're not seeing that problem. Are there any implications for cryogenics with this? Cryogenics, uh, cryogenics is, is the freezing. Are we talking cryogenics of, of tissues, organs, heads, and bodies? Yeah, cryogenics, which has been around since, my God, I remember the Skeptic Society in California. We had somebody from uh, Cryonics, the California company, come in, the president. My God, that was back in 1980-something when, of course, we all learned that Walt Disney had frozen his head and, and others. Um, the issue here is that the only, the only implication here would be that if some of those cells are viable in those body parts that were frozen, that looks pretty good. The chance of rectifying, reviving any glands, organs, organ systems, or central nervous system, you know, would probably be nil to none. But if those cells are still viable, because we know that everywhere we're going to find some of these stem cell niches, there is an opportunity. So could we clone Walt Disney back from one of his cells? Yeah, we could as we sit here right now and say, yeah, we could. Have we done it? Of course we haven't because I haven't seen Walt. But, but can we do it in laboratory animals? Oh, yeah, slam dunk.
Yeah, you guys have seen Jurassic Park, right? <clears throat> With the removing the DNA from uh, mosquito. That's not pie in the sky. That actually was based upon the university I did my undergraduate in, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. That's the lab where that research is being done, is removing DNA. It's not intact, but there are ways to back clone and get those things. And you know, National Geographic, I think, is sponsoring this back cloning of the woolly mammoth or the mastodon. So you could have woolly mammoth coming to you. The last time they were in Grand Rapids was 10,000 years ago. How cool would that be, John Ball? <laughs> <coughs> okay, I, I just want to make sure I know how to talk to people who might be anti-stem cell research. We can now take a, a regular cell and make it go backward into a total... Totipotent? To, totipotent no, cell. Potent. Yeah, the, so, sec the second best Does one, that yeah. mean we're getting close to not needing those little baby... Yeah, that's our goal. Yeah, cells. that's the goal. Yeah, the question is, you know, can we eventually get away from using embryonic stem cells? We certainly hope so, sure. That's the whole goal. Let's get away from that and we avoid that bio... One of the bioethical debates. Mm -hmm. People will still wonder, is that should we allow Charles to clone himself? We're going to have to vote, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so so there's, there's still that issue, okay? <clears throat> but, you know, if we can get away from at least that one huge bioethical issue, that would be wonderful. But as I mentioned at the beginning, we have to make sure that we have our technique down, that the reason we can't do it is because the cell can't do it. We want to make sure that it's not our technique. And that's the advantage of using the totipotent right now is that if we can't turn it into the cell we want, we know the cell can do it. It's got to be our technique. So once we get the techniques down, sure, we should be able to do that. And I don't think we're that far off from, from doing that. But I said, there's, as I list, there's a lot we need to learn at the biochemical level on how these things are happening. Don't let me lead you to believe that, you know, you're gonna be able to do anything in five years, but it's, it's just going gangbusters right now. So, I work for Spectrum Health in the um, clinical research department, mm -hmm. and um, I work on the cardiovascular team, and we have an opportunity to do a peripheral stem cell search, mm -hmm. research and stuff. But um, it's being questioned because of the resources that it might take. I'm thinking it would be worth it regardless considering many of the things you mentioned, Van mm -hmm. Andel, et cetera, being on the cutting edge. Oh my God, yeah. I think that we should just jump at the opportunity. Yeah. Would you say, assuming all the preceding things, the appropriate preceding things have been done to get it to this stage, making it safe, safe and efficacious that we should pursue it? Oh my, my God, yes. I mean, Van Andel Research Institute, again, you know, you look at it as the little building in the corner, understand their mission statement is, you know, my, my interpretation of their mission statement is to become the leading Molecular Research Institute on the planet for their four diseases, which is Parkinson's, cancer, Alzheimer's, and cystic fibrosis. And, and they're just about there. You know, realize those are not physicians working at Van Andel. Those are molecular biologists and geneticists. They're PhDs, not MDs. Because you're looking at the molecular basis of disease. That's very different than fixing your cardiovascular disease. Let's prevent you from getting there in the first place. And we're able to do that. And as you know, in the cardiovascular unit, probably Research has been, we know that cancer cells have the ability to release, release something called angiogenic chemicals. They cause blood vessels to grow to the tumor. This is what's so hideous about cancerous tumors. They need a vast supply of oxygen and glucose. They send out angiogenic chemicals that cause the blood vessels to grow through the tumor. We're able to isolate and reproduce those angiogenic chemicals and in laboratory animals, inject them into the occluded arteries. And instead of doing open heart transplants, open heart surgery, we just grow new vessels around the damaged area. Beats the heck out of crack in the chest, as we say in the biz. So it's just incredible out there right now, what's available, and to not do it. And we're hoping our new governor, who of course has this very strong pro-business, let's get Michigan in front, this is the place to do it, because folks, where are we banking most of our effort here in Western Michigan? It's medical mile and it's technology, it's not tools anymore. Yeah. What is the potential for human longevity or human immortality? Are we talking about Charles again? <laughs> uh, well, for as far as longevity, there, there are so many issues that come into play. In my, my uh, major's anatomy physiology class, the last two lectures is that we've spent a year telling you how to maintain health, normal anatomy, normal physiology, now to spend three hours killing you. So we senesce, we age, and we die for a very long laundry of solutions. If we could stop those telomeres from falling off, that's one of the many issues that comes into play. So that's, there's nothing on the horizon there as far as doing that. We'll be able to get that heart that may have start to shut down on you working again? Sure. Can we get that brain that may have had a stroke working again? Sure. For those of you who own, own car, old cars, you know when the first idiot light comes on the dash, and you go, oh, check tire. I can live with that, okay? Then it says, check engine. I can live with that. And then it says, 
Smog, I can live with that. And pretty soon there's so many lights on your dashboard and the car quits. Most of us have most of our idiot lights going on right now, don't we? So we might be able to turn off some of those lights and get you going a little more, another 100,000 miles, but it's not going to go forever. <laughs> yeah, after year 30, it's like damage control, isn't it? I, Captain, we're breaking up and there's nothing we can do. <laughs> I'm only human. <laughs> during, during the 2008 campaign, when we had, um, we were looking at uh, passing the referendum to legalize stem cell research, uh, the production of new, new stem cell lines here in Michigan. I did a lot of reporting on that. And one of the things that I, that I wrote an article about back then was uh, the research team there at University of Madison that you mentioned, which is, they actually discovered embryonic stem cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one in Japan, uh, right about the same time, announced that they had managed to take human skin cells, uh, adult somatic skin cells, yeah. and, and reprogram them back to their embryonic state mm -hmm. to become pluripotent. The problem that they ran into with that, and when I interviewed some of the researchers that did it, they said the problem with this is we can only do it by, by introducing viral DNA into the process. Mm -hmm. So right. if we were to use that and then implant it into a real human being, it would cause cancer. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's proof of concept. We know we can do it. Now we have to find a different way to do it that doesn't cause all of these problems. Has any progress been made in the last two years on that? Yeah, absolutely. What Ed was mentioning to us is that uh, the way that we induce a lot of these factors and or splices of DNA to cause these stem cells to become what we want is by using viral messengers to do this. The problem is by doing that, these viruses, which aren't life forms, they're in that netherworld between living and non-living, they can take up residency in the cell, in the tissue, in the organ, in the organ system, in the organism, and can cause problems. In fact, during the last administration, when there was a federal ban on any new stem cell research, except for the 20 existing stem cell lines that we had, virtually all of them were contaminated by the, the, the viral vehicles that were used to develop those in the mice precursors. So nobody was willing to work on those because you had the virus contamination, you had everything else. Yes, there are other vehicles to deliver that into some cells now. So, and Ed put it beautifully, is that we've done proof of concept. We know we can do it. Now, as I said, our hurdles, we have to do it so it's safe for the patient, so we can replicate it and it resides in the patient over the long term and that's where we're still going. So is there a clinical application? No, but we have found other ways to do it that aren't a viral. I'm gonna play down the, uh, the ethical uh, questions that you threw out at the end. So my mind uh, instantly goes to, well, if we can do this now or very soon, um, how would I go about growing bodies, one or more bodies identical to my own for parts, mm -hmm. and obviously there have been movies about this, but I think it's a serious question. How would you ethically clone yourself, raise the body minus consciousness to the point where you could start using parts? You saw the movie Island, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it, great movie, of course, now you know the plot. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I do think it's a relevant question for, for those of us who uh, judge life, uh, what, the value of life by consciousness, human experience, and so forth, if you kept a body comatose or what have you, so it never had mm -hmm. that. Sure. Would it be ethical? Well, if your transmission goes out in your 72 Honda, do you have to go and buy a new 72 Honda, or can you buy a new transmission? You can buy a new transmission. That's where we want to go. So the idea here is to not to grow, like all the sci-fi, to grow a whole new body to produce that organ, but to grow the organ itself. You ready for the drum roll? We have successfully grown human spleens in the laboratory. We regularly grow noses and ears and chins. We did spleens, because spleens are a no-brainer. They're a very simple internal architecture. We made a lattice structure out of algin that comes from seaweed and you put the spleen cells on there. If you grow spleen cells in a Petri dish, you get a flat mat of spleen cells. They don't know to grow up and look <laughs> like a spleen. So you build them a little architecture, they grow up into the matrix, and then eventually metabolize away the algin superstructure and produce their own reticular fibers, producing a spleen. We grow ears, we grow noses, we grow cheeks in the lab already. Our goal is not to produce the entire organism to produce the kidney, let's produce the kidney. Let's just get the transmission, not the 82 Honda. Well, 
Okay, so great. It's, it's all well and good to talk about regenerating organs, possibly curing cancer, but let's get serious. Is it possible that these stem cells could one day help us grow more hair on the top of our heads? <laughs> well, you and I have talked about that, but it clearly we're an artifact of our own high testosterone levels. Yar! Thank you, guys. I'll be around if you have any questions.